And uh, I made a big change because John Hall is so important and has to be explained very carefully that, and Dave supported this, use the whole class to get John Hall down. Yeah. And there is a reason you go to Harper's Ferry and you, they sort of, they touch on John Hall, but that's it. You could, you know, the one exhibit that shows the turning lathes and those sorts of things. But there's a reason there's not much about him because historians, especially in this region, are favoring Civil War as a you know, military history. They, they're all in, onto that. And you're not going to find very many um, good, I'll, I'll just tell you something. There was a magazine called uh, uh, The History of Technology, and its editor was fantastic. His name was Edwin, Dr. Edwin Layton. And he, I've always found him for Rumsey and Hall, somebody who could write it and, you know, but there are not many people who can do that. John Hall is an interesting challenge. There's not a, there's no likeness of him. There's no biography of him. There's all, he did a whole series of patents, right? In 1827. And Mer Merritt Rose Smith's seminal book. I'll show everybody. We need to say, <clears throat> thank God for Merritt Rose Smith. This is the MIT professor. I met him. He's just a wonderful guy. This is the one that said, made everyone understand John Hall was the, was the original creator of the essential elements of the American factory system. Think of, think of England being the industrial revolution in circle based on the steam engine. Well, John Hall is the American industrial revolution based on precision use of metal objects. But he figured it out, he had no patents. He said that uh, in this book that they've disappeared. They're not even in the in the proper government place in the archive, and the ones that did survive didn't make it through a pat, a fire in 1836 of the patent office. So I'm a researcher. This is an interesting one, and what's also tricky about it is it has so many potential lead points. Are you going to do interchangeable parts? When you're doing research, it's like software architecture. It has layers, you know. When you understand this certain level, it disappears and you have a whole new set of other issues that you now realize and you go, you go it's like, what's research is like that. John Hall is so interesting and, and, and changing that the deeper you get, your what is the most important priority kind of starts sliding around. So um, anyway, enough, enough complaining. <laughs> I'll first explain this. Look at your, you all have this. If you have this in front of you, this really helps. Do you have this, Dave? Do you have this? Okay, we'll, we'll figure that out. I'll show it when I talk about it. What it does, I'll call this a visual executive summary. But look at it, and let's start at the upper right. Might know the, the viewer's upper left. John Hall, you know, he was from Maine and he was in Harper's Ferry and he died in 1841 after proving his success. Uh, going down that, that the left side, I put, I'm showing you the pulleys and the le leather, leather uh, straps. And that, that's going to point to one of the big insights he had, which is not written about at all. It's a secondary thing, which was how to get as much energy and speed from water power uh, over a long period of time that that also, uh, well, if you have enormously high, he's cutting metal, he's cutting iron. So you need a hell of a lot of power. And so being able to find a way to get the most energy and the most power pack out of the water, uh, from the water using tightened up blades and, so, and pulleys and such. And here, this, is what's, this is what research is like. This next image, that one, I, I was rechecking my, my previous work. No, it's not a drop hammer. <laughs> no, it's not a, it's not a 
it's a kill tamer. And, and it's for punching out a die at die castings, you know. And I, I had two errors on the, on the, on the uh, three part videos. One was just a dumb error. I added a zero to the tolerance, which is just a dumb error. And I corrected that with a statement. But um, uh, the speed of this, this thing is banging out die casts and it could do um, 33 in a minute. That's a lot of power, 33 in a minute. So that, that whole little column is about the issue of that. And then going down on the, these are the, the whole rifles. The, the 1841 musket is the one that is completely done by machine. And next to it is the thing that we most easily understand are the gauges and an example of all the things, uh, parts of a rifle. Uh, yeah, we'll just call it a rifle. And there was a man, I'm, I'm quoting here, here somewhere, a man named Dr. William Roberts said, because Paul, you know, came up with these gauges of such, a, such great uh, precision, he said, that is the foundation of the American factory system, that one thing. And it's kind of funny, you know, remember when they, not that we were there, but they were building the old National Road in the 1830s or something. And the, and the Irish workers and the people from, from the people that came were, were making, create, creating a, a stone bed. Well, they had big rings. You know, they, they would size them by throwing them through a ring. So everybody's catching on to this. Um, what you just saw I described was John Hall, the pulleys and, and maximizing. Uh, the gauges, and then everything further on, everything to the rest of this is about very, very important people in the process and how, how great it became. You cannot, you cannot underestimate the impact. So, and in doing research, the reason you're willing to jump into this, this terribly challenging structured sentence thing is because this called the Carrington Committee. And you see, when you start doing research, you need something that's always gonna make it worthwhile. The Carrington Committee, and I'll let, let you enjoy it, it's, it's dramatic importance in American history. Uh, it's, in, it's in what I'm going to read. Uh, I'm gonna start a segment and say one other thing. I'm going to drop this into the context of all of some of our previous classes. It doesn't have to do with most well, last week because that was about the women. We're, we're going to skip over that. We're going to skip over the, the, the class about the Civil War. I think before that was about uh, uh, equality and race. But the first, the first two bring us to this. Remember, we're talking about the personality, the temper, the identity of people here. And we talked about the first settlers, whether they were Lutheran or Scott or, or Irish, had a, had a culture of personal liberty, and I'm going to do it my way. And, and, and a, a bravery, a dissenting courage. Well, as time went on, we also said that first they began that way, and that, that quality of fighting, fighting for your rights was invaluable during the revolution, and it inspired George Washington. See, we made that identity element having played that role. Well, they were enjoying Eden with a, self, a subsistence living that was still paradise. You could grow food. You didn't need any, you didn't have to trade abroad. Everything was self-contained. But you're also developing this sense of, of uh, isolation. You're being very isolated and becoming a little resistant to anything from the outside. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm heading towards John Hall. So those qualities of, of your personal liberties, here comes the railroad. Oh, that's great. Oh, I, I can make my wheat and sell it to Europe and get a lot of money. And I'm going to build a big house now. But you're being, you're being tied into the system. And they're starting to lose that, that, that independence now. <laughs> Nothing is more pivotal than to be like a German gunsmith with enormously developed craft skills. Rumsey was the same thing. And out on the, the frontier, this, this bit, bit, town with iron 
you had millions of opportunities to create unheard of solutions. You can, it's like a wonderful place to try new things. That's how they became so creative. So you have this culture of, okay, the armory is beginning. George Washington said, by God, that's where it has to be because there's all these really good German gunsmiths that went, to the, went through the Master Apprentice Program, like the Sheetzes, who were here. That's why they left here, because they're looking for their guns uh, to march to Boston. So the image of the almost an artistic, an artist craftsman, you know, you, you make it perfectly unto itself. That's the key thing. And you add wonderful enameling and you, you just make it a work of art. And remember, they worked by the cycles of nature and time clocks were total, totally irrelevant to that lifestyle. When you finished your, your weapon, you, it was time to harvest. You go out and finish the rest of the work. Your own rhythms are all there. Then, lo and behold, a guy from Maine, for God's sake, <coughs> comes here and says, no, 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 no. I, I, I don't want you to make a gun. I want you to make machines that are going to replace you. <laughs> Now this is this is now you're seeing it's like the ultimate dig. Who needs a brilliant artistic craftsman? That's what this is all saying. And and, and I'm going to start reading now. But the gist of it is, do you know why we need to change? We need speed, delivery time, because we learned from the War of 1812, we can't defend ourselves. So that's the state. So that that fierce independence becomes expresses itself as is relentless attack on the heroic efforts of John Hall, the specific one, Harpers Ferry, they call it the Junto, Junto, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, Mr. Stumblefield and Mr. Uh, Armstead Beckham and, and Fontaine Beckham were like the guys who ran, ran uh, Harpers Ferry, and everything was designed to be mod moderately efficient, just moderately, okay, but, but you get all your, all your voters paid, <laughs> you yeah. know. That's the system. So this guy comes in actually wants to get things done right. It can almost be a bad comedy. Are you ready? That heat, okay, here we go. Are we doing, do you have any questions? But you can see that hard headedness suddenly come back in the wrong form. Here we go. <clears throat> the workforce in the earliest days of the northernmost Shenandoah Valley included highly resourceful apprentice system German gunsmiths who had developed the Kentucky rifle. One reason why George Washington insisted in 1794 to have the army put at Harper's Ferry against all opposition. So the existence of the Springfield Arms Factory, that was the one already established in Massachusetts, that also argued for an armory in a southern state while helping, helping Washington's Potomac Company to fulfill their dream of uniting the coast with the bountiful hinterlands using the Potomac River. So that's his own private angle on this. And it's amazing how everybody who supported the army had shares of the Potomac Company. In the War of 1812, this is the big wake up call. American soldiers often found themselves holding a musket with a defective part while bullets flew past. There was no supply box in which any of the parts of the musket could be selected and substituted to make the musket work again. So he dropped the still valuable musket and ran. Now this guy is either the best or worst boss in the world, but he made it happen. Colonel George Bumford, he's not on our thing. He was the, of the US Ordnance Department, hired John Hancock, Hancock Hall to lead experiments. Notice experiments. It's R and D to solve this <clears throat> problem at Harpers Ferry, and aiming to make any part from any musket usable in another light model. And so now you're going to hear the voice of John Hall, Merritt Rose Smith's chief source were letters. You're going to see the self confidence. I, I almost feel like affecting a main accent, you know. He writes to John C. Calhoun, May 18, the principles upon which my tools and machines have been constructed are applicable to every species of small arms and have their object, the production of perfect uniformity with the least possible expense. 
And when completed, the machine will answer as well for 100,000 guns as for 1,000. So the work progresses. And he writes Calhoun again with a bold claim. This is 22 now. He's really, right now, he ha he's got almost all of it. He's got the gauges figured out, uh, but, but it's almost there. I have, I have succeeded in establishing methods for fabricating arms ex exactly alike and with economy by the hands of common workmen. And in such manner as to ensure, ensure a perfect observance of any established model and to furnish in the arms themselves a complete test of their conformity to it, gauges. People had gauges, but there's something about, how I don't even know how he gets, what tools he's using to get them so precise. Hall's greatness lay in the four years from 1822 to 1826, which he worked exhaustively. He basically worked him to death to create more than, that's why you don't have a painting. This is a guy who you could never sit down for a painting. Okay. His greatness lay in these years. And he, he created these 63 gauges of different 63 parts for every weapon. He wrote, to avoid, to avoid minute errors. This is his phrase all the time. I will perform, I will perform and gauge every operation from one point called a bearing in the form of extraordinarily precise metal gauges. Each, this is interesting, each is case hardened to protect their surfaces and edges. This is like, what would you call it? This is like the one you keep in the safe, you know. This is, this is, don't, this is that. <clears throat> now, here's the key quote I said. Hall's, according to Dr. William Robert, Hall's greatest achievement came when he machined metal parts to a tolerance of one hundredth of an inch a feat never before accomplished. For this, he is widely credited for completing the foundation of the American Industrial Revolution. See, now you're starting to get it. He really, really is important in history, and we don't, we don't get told about it. It's probably because it's hard to explain. But then, this is what I overlooked a little bit. He also designed his own machines. They figure that. And even machines that made the part making machines. This is the whole thing. So that they regularly produced results free of what Hall called minute errors caused by changes in the temperature, abrasions, and subtle variations. Now, there's something we can all easily understand. He said, it's funny the way he wrote about it, they don't make it more complicated than it really is. You got a square piece, you think it's a completely 90 degree square piece of metal. Well, the, in the old days, they would measure this, this corner and they, they go over here and use it to be the, the, the absolute accurate corner for the next one. And then they would measure that one for the third corner. Notice they're just all parts of a piece of metal. And it's sort of, so the whole point is, he said, he kept saying, each time you take the previous corner and go around, you're, you're creating more variation. You know, and it seems so obvious to us. But remember, in the craftsman tradition, precision was not the point. I mean, enough precision. But he, that's what he's saying is, you know, I have a big, big black uh, ruler, you know, uh, what you use in measuring, you know, black and heavy. It has to have an external source. Like the gauge has to be taken out of the thing and being a freestanding, he calls it a bearing. You can tell me if I'm wrong about that. Okay. So this is the next thing. Hall's, and, and this is not emphasized enough. Hall, when they look at the water here, and, and like at Springfield, they look at the water, they say, oh my God, that's what I need. Because you need, need really powerful hits to cut iron. And most men can't do that over and over and over and over again, really a lot. That's the key. The water can't. Dan, Pope, Dan Tokar put it to me this way. There's the best machine and the best man. And the best machine is the water powered. Okay. Paul's endless tweaking and trials led him to another historic realization. If you can harness the water power and you can direct the greatest amount of water power, precisely upon a metal surface, 
to punch a hole or cut a line or curve on the metal. And if your tools and equipment keep the object of the work, this is important, perfectly still and always still despite thunderous impacts. You see, each time you take another step, you find more problems. The harder you hit, the harder it is to keep the machine from vibrating and such. So he, kept, so he said, you've got to have everything perfectly still. Next comes a lot of vises and fasteners. You never, you know, everything is, is locked down with screws. Stillness, stillness, stillness. The next thing he finds out, and when people first saw his machines, they said, these are huge. This, is, this must be really dumb because they're really huge. He went up to the Antietam Ironworks and says, I want you to make me, I better stick with my script, I'll get it. Okay. He surveyed the Shenandoah River along his operation and its vast utility. In his machine shop, he created a hanging forest of pulleys. How do you capture that water? Looped with leather belts, all of which was attached to, of course, to a shaft leading to the water wheels, scooping up the waters, river, river's water, and capturing its force. And this is what's interesting. This is not talked about because it's so commonplace. He, he could keep the losing keep from losing any of that raw power by adding leather belts and widening them, increasing the belt's traction much the way a modern day automobile's wider and thicker tire can. And, and, and when he was transmitting force to the leather belts and the pulleys, the belts would, would also not stretch and wear out too quickly. And then he also figured out another thing. Okay, he could also determine how much power was transmitted say to a, a trip hammer or chilt hammer, pounding out holes for screws, and it, by making substitutions in the belts and the sizing. See, they, they were getting to a point where they could regulate how much speed they want. And you know, when you, when you have a tire, they would have these little, you know, when you're trying to balance a tire, you put little metal pieces around, around the rim to keep the weight even. You know what I'm talking about? Those like little add-ons. They did the same concept. Paul further improved his power yield of his pulleys and leather belts by balancing the wheels of the pulleys in a way much like today when lead weights are applied to the rim of a tire to balance it. Everything was to keep the energy not jiggling, not just straight ahead. And so why this is important is they want real output, real hard working, pounding, pounding, pounding. So Everything has to be literally grounded. General Wood of the Ordnance Department reported that not only could machines moving parts operate well at 3,000 revolutions per minute, the speed could also be increased or reduced at will using these techniques like substitutions. And so no transmitted power was wasted. And as I mentioned before, the trip, the tilt hammer could, could deliver 33 complete cuts in a minute on, on in a die casting. That's the, fir that's the first softened piece of iron. So then he finds that the machine, machines start shaking because they're on wooden. This is like the age shift from wood to, to metal. The wood frames just couldn't move, <laughs> they, they just crumble. So here comes the ironworks, the Antietam ironworks. And he goes, he goes up to the Antietam Ironworks and he ordered, he shows the uh, drawings and patterns to iron, Antietam Ironworks for heavy iron carriages and frames to stabilize his machines. See, each thing shows the next thing that needs to be fixed. That's the amazing thing. He did everything and hard. Nobody could reach his level of his, of his of focus and obsession. The solidity, mass, and great weight of Hall's all important metal cutting and milling machines. See the gauges and the all important metal cutting and milling machines. Those milling machines. These are his patents that were that dis disappeared, but they provided the stability during their operation, allowing very rapidly spinning cutters to make clean and even deep cuts in the metal that met the extremely demanding standards for in interchangeability. This capability allowed Hall to make finer parts. And at this point, uh, they could make cuts in his 1819 by patent rifle, one of his first. They could make cuts in parts. There was 23 different parts in just the lock. So this was an incredible challenge he was meeting. 
All the while, you can see this happening. He is hired not exactly to produce X number of rifles. He is he's hired to also figure out a way to be interchangeable. So he's, he's really an experiment. Merritt Rose Smith said it was a proving ground that was hugely successful. It was R&D. But here comes the conflict with Stubblefield and Beckham and all the other arsenal. They did a terrible job. <laughs> you should see the reports. I, the, these people would see Paul's and they would say his, they, theirs on the atomic side, they just shake their heads. But in all fairness, they didn't understand. Paul got a lot of money because one third of it had nothing to, had to do with invention and create making machines didn't exist. And they didn't understand that. So they were always fighting about his budget. And they, they couldn't produce anything hardly with their budget, but that was the source of, that was, that was the rub. Excuse me. Who is that? Who, who, is, who is the bay that gives him his Okay, budget? Stubblefield was made, Stubblefield is made the uh, superintendent of the, of the, of the arsenal. But they gave, they gave, and he technically, technically Hall answered to him, but because of the politics, they just, cut a big safety circle around Paul and said, just do your work. But there was a tension because his work was so fundamentally different and they understood the threat to their, their, their arrangement of having every local local guy hired. You know, they, they just hired guys who were not very skilled and, and they'd always knock off the, they knocked off work. It was a lazy, sloppy organization, period. But you can see- The organization you're referring to again. It's, okay. There's a Pacific, I mean, the Potomac side and the rifle work side of, of, uh, of Harper's Fair. The rifle works is on Shenandoah. That's where the real new machines are being made. And I, I need to clarify that, but the real making of new things was over on the Shenandoah side. And I, I can easily see that the weapons at a certain stage the finishing stage probably go over to the arsenal for the finishing stage. So, but that, that thank you. That's, that's what seems to be the case. So, during the, his two decades at Harpers Ferry, Paul developed and constructed drop hammers, which became tilt hammers. Stop, these, these are all the metal machines. Stock making machines, balanced pulleys, drilling machines, and special machines for straight cutting, lever cutting, curved cutting. We're moving into the world of metal. And Hall's straight cutting machine was the forerunner of today's versatile milling machine and a critical tool used in the fabrication of precision metal firearm components. Now, just for everybody here, one of my sources was three really good articles in Harper's Ferry New Monthly, 1852 and 1857. And the one in 1857, a guy named Rance Meyer was part of the group who saw Harper's Ferry. <laughs> and I just say, I want to relieve a certain part of all of you. He just hated, you no, know, he said, why don't you make sides instead of stuff that's so complicated? He said, I learned from this operation, it's very complicated business to kill people. So you had this guy reminding everybody that you're making guns to kill people. And I always have to remember this, you know, I know you're kind of, wait a minute, but that's true. It's, it's, it is true. But never forget, what he did has been used for virtually everything now. Now, this is the fun part. <clears throat> Demands, okay, here's Stubblefield and Beckham, they just, Ah, oh, this, this reminds me of politics in Jefferson County. They're just mad. I don't know what, I just mad at you. <laughs> That's how it is. And, and they demand for outside evaluations, demand of Hall's achievements that each upheld it and, and each one that was made upheld his claims, but they demanded another one. And they demanded another one. And the only way I can put it is they were jealous uh, and, and he was powerful enemies and uh, fearing that Hall's new contracts properly would cut into their own federal funding. That makes sense. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Is it real? <clears throat> the soldiers who put this gun on the test at Fortress Monroe, Virginia, had a trial there in 18, 1824. 
where they shot John Hall's rifles, and they also shot Model 1814 Harper's Ferry conventional rifles. Comparison, some contract rifles and muskets. This is not even a big one. Hall's rifles performed exceedingly well over five months of continuous use by soldiers in the field at Fortress Monroe. The Hall rifle could fire 100 shots during the time a common rifle could fire only 43, and a musket 37. The examiners concluded that after 8,710 charges, when they compared, compared the common rifle to the musket, Hall's rifle's rate and general superiority has been manifest. This doesn't keep Subblefield from fighting it. The American system of manufacturing, courtesy of Johns Hall's incredible tenacity, I call it political pugilism, because he, didn't, he was good at a fight, and he, he, had, he had lobbyists in place in Washington. He knew all the things you had to do. John Hall, okay. was, he, he knew all the things he had to do. He had people there. Ultimately, he, wasn't, he was going to get defeated by... Um, uh, Dave has a question. Dave. Jim, what year was John born? <laughs> 1781. 1781, 1840. 1781 in Maine. So he's, yeah. he's, a, he's a very young man during this period in the 20s. 40, yeah, yeah. We like that. I like that being a very young man. <laughs> no, but he, you're exactly right. He had a work ethic that just would, would kill a horse. You know, what, what I'm hearing here is that we have like an engineer. Yeah. And he also has the, 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 the smarts to realize that he needs like lobbyists. You know, that's an unusual combination. In you're exactly right. That's why, he, you know, that you see what an immensely talented man this was. And you know what? It, sometimes when you have such an, it's, it's like Steve Jobs. Everybody hated him, but they loved him, right? I mean, what he came up with, yeah. that's how it is. But, but this, is, this is a very good analogy between Steve Jobs and John Hall. Steve Jobs would tell you, you know why I'm kind of difficult to work with? Because there's a canvas out there that I'm trying to paint. And my brush is 3,000 damn employees who I'm trying to make the right brush strokes for me. And that's just what Hall's situation was. How do you, and this, this thing that's never been done before. And those are the real heroes that you have to be persnickety and all that. And because and, and, in the end, who cared what, what a tough guy Steve Jobs was? But you know, that's the image. How do you get 3,000 people to do it? Okay, well, he had. Okay, we're going on. All right, so he had all the pugilism and all that. And because of these tenacity, political pugilism, and genius, uh, the industrial the system of manufacture became a fact and dawned over the world in early 1827 at Harper's Ferry with an ex examination of his opponents were sure would say, John Hall's folly. <clears throat> there was, a, there, you see the good guys and the bad guys all swimming around. Roswell Lee had been the super, he's a good man. He's, he'd been the superintendent of Harper's Ferry. He knew everybody at Springfield. You, you really value the good people who make things go forward. Roswell Lee said, okay, I'm going to find three men to evaluate. This is politically loaded, you know. And it's so easy to stack a committee with people that are just not going to do it. First, he gets a guy named James Bell. At the last minute, he gets a guy named James Bell, largely because he was a local bigwig to mollify the local critics. He just had to get someone local. But Roswell Lee made sure he got agreements from James Carrington he was, he was Eli Whitney's machinist and armor and foreman. You don't get it. You know, he's getting the best. And he is known for his strict integrity. And, you know, he, he, uh, so, and he, he inspected Whitney's guns for the government. Number two guy, <clears throat> I love these old-time names, 
don't name your son Luther Sage. <laughs> Luther will get him beat up on the playground. So, but Luke, it's true, right? What's my name? Luther? Just on a principle. <laughs> okay. But Luther, who's the next guy? He's the inspector of arms at Springfield. Now, this is, this is serious. So suddenly, everybody kind of moves up in their chair because these guys are going to tell you the real thing. They're no-nonsense guys. The Carrington threesome received about, think how they did this, received five dozen, it's really the 63, parts for each of Hall, of 100 Hall rifles, all mixed together like a big, you know, smorgasbord. And, the, and they were given 100 new stocks that were to go with assemblages. And uh, they were delivered to, from Hall's Rifle Works, around which the men were able to easily assemble an assembling arm around its gun stock. Well, that's, that's the details. But the most important thing is parts have a number, which corresponds to the number of the rifle and all the pieces. They all have the same number. There's no numbers. This is a really well done experiment. There's no, it's just pure, does it fit or not? And they did something I wish they did today. You cannot dispute whatever the heck they decide. It's so well done. No numbers. It's purely does it fit. So based on three weeks of inspecting Hall's operation in December 1826, they published their 17-page report the following month in January. And I love, you know, in the classic academic understatement, Merritt Rose Smith wrote, <laughs> it is doubtful, remember, these are really tough guys. Smith wrote, it is doubtful that Hall himself <laughs> could have composed a more laudatory documents. This is amazing. This is a serious technical document. The report from their notes began, it is well known that arms have never been made so, made so exactly of the several parts and so that the parts on being changed, you know, would quit, uh, suit equally well when applied to every other arm. Yet, the machines we have examined effect this with a certainty and precision we should not have believed till we witnessed it, witnessed their operation. Wow. Seeing is believing. You never see that in the dry report. These guys are dry too. They go on. If uniformity is therefore in the component parts of small arms, if that is therefore an important desert, desideratum, desideratum, it is in our opinion, completely accomplished by the plan which Hall carried into effect. By no other process known to us, and we have seen most, if not all, that are in the use in the United States, could arms be made so exactly alike as to interchange and require no marks on the different parts. And we're very much in doubt whether the best workmen that may be selected from any armory with the aid of the best machines and used elsewhere could in a whole life make a hundred rifles or muskets that would, after being out of this phrase, promiscuously mixed together. Yes, Al. Um, in terms of the, uh, the speed of building one right from uh, uh, consumption to uh, use as a, uh, as opposed to building the a gunsmith is about three months three months to build a right if a gunsmith makes every part and and, and, and everything works you know perfect unto itself one of my best sources which was Eric Johnson who is a blacksmith and was an arms tour guide in the park service he explained this to me about three months to make it by hand. Yeah. Now, how long did it take to make uh, a hall right? Well, you put your finger on something. They're not being, they're not, they're, they, they had all the time in the world. This particular test was great for the actual, but the issue of, 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 of speed being added was not considered. Is that kind of where you're going? Yeah. Yeah. What they, they've got, yeah. What this did was our purpose is to show that this works regardless of who the person is, who's making it. 
we're going to show that it's, it's independent of a of a person, but that's the next issue. Okay, a little bit more on this. Thank you, Al. That's good. So they said mix together. Uh, you just get, I, um, promiscuously fit together to fit together, and they fit each other in these rifles with that. I love this with that with that exact nicety. <laughs> Where did words go? That is to be found in these manufactured by Hall. So Hall's guns have a, an exact nicety. And I could go on and on, but they say so many good things. But, you know, you got the idea. Yeah. And so Smith had a beautiful way of put it, Merritt Rose Smith, much of the excitement. And you got to understand, this was immediate. It just was a, it was like a tidal wave, Springfield and everything. It's everybody... This was so definitive, everybody jumped. That's why it's hard, it was hard to trace who, start, who really got the credit. Much of the excitement Smith wrote, generated by the special investigation of 1826, can be traced directly to Hall's success in combining men, machines, and precision measurement methods into a practical system of production. And this is the phrase I like. In this sense, Hall's work represented an important extension. That's the way he sees it of the Industrial Revolution in America, and this is my se the sentence I love, a mechanical synthesis so different in degree as to constitute a difference in kind. What a nice phrase. It's not a matter of degree, it's a whole different animal. All right. Another thing is teenagers can run. One kid, one kid could go back and forth the two running machines, because they just had to flip some switches. And the machines, this is a science. we're talking about machines temporarily here. The machines, were, you're right, uh, we got the in, in interchangeability done. But they also said activity was more necessary than judgment. And young boys or common hands could successfully run the machines. They both functioned without any manual guidance, but evidently ceased operations. That's the key. The machines were designed to shut down immediately when they're finished, so they can go back and forth between three machines. What you're sensing here is automation starting up. And I like to say what this is all about, it's all about the beginning of how we were able to get a lot of cool stuff and really boring jobs. <laughs> That's really what the effect was, because they demanded such speed out of the people who worked on these things. I see why they have labor unions. But we got cool stuff. Then God help us when plastic shows up and computers shows up. It's like, oh my gosh. Above all, manufacturers everywhere, if they followed Hall's practical system, this is to be exactly, would succeed in the same world with changing results, the same world changing results. Hall's, Hall's work could be regularly replicated and even scaled up. But we still want to stick with what Al said, this issue. This became a problem later, okay, the, the speed, the demand for speed. Or the Ordnance Department doubled Hall's salary because of this report, increased it to $1,450 a year, and they asked him to make uh, from 1000 to three, and he had trouble doing it, but for many, many reasons. And they continued this royalty of $1 on each finished arm. And this is, okay, they were rewarding Hall above all for his improvements in the process. Remember, that's one-third of his whole budget especially for the use of certain milling type machines for cutting. This is a key phrase, cutting metallic substances. And Hall was smart enough that the day before he signed, all his patents were submitted. Those are the ones that have absolutely disappeared. And there was one more guy who never had a nice word to say in the ordinance department about Hall, Colonel George Talcott, who now says in 1832, Hall's manufacturing has been carried to a greater degree of perfection as regards the quality of work and uniformity of parts than is to be found anywhere. Almost everything is performed by machinery, leaving very little dependent on manual labor, common hands. Now, on your, on your poster, the second most important person. What's our question? Do these things, is John Hall the only guy who can make these things? It's, it's all dependent on him? That has, to be, that has to be tested. 
Down in the center, this man here, Simeon North. That, you know, this is the next very important thing. Simeon North is just almost about as sharp as a, as a John Hall. But when the breakthrough came in 1834, when Simeon North had his works in Middletown, Connecticut, and, and, and I have to stress, assiduously, he couldn't get it right first with just the gauges, and Hall just had a fit. You didn't use my patterns. How do you use the one that's the master pattern? You wore it out. You just you didn't understand. Everything has to be perfect. Okay, but then he got he woke up, got that busy. He assiduously followed Hall's very precise and demanding instructions, as well as using Hall's patterns for machines, tools, and gauges. And man, you get praise from Hall. You did it. You did something. And by the way, Fraser loved Hall loved to say he liked to do inspections of inspections. Oh man, that must be tough. But North too demonstrated that he could make breech loading rifles on par with Hall's, and Paul and Hall agreed. Perfectly interchangeable. And it was it was when everyone was sure that this revolution in kind, not only in degree was and, and but it was portable and not just confined to and intermixed with one man's genius. That's when everything took off, you know. And um, we had armies in St. Louis. We had, I mean, all were, right at this point, is anyone surprised that Hall's men are quitting? You know, they were getting other work. And, you know, they're so tired of these others. That's why I think they doubled the salary. Here's Ephraim. Yeah, oh no, <laughs> you got it. And you see, you, you, this is so modern day. Stubblefield never read the Carrington report and said it was wrong. <laughs> You know, we still have that today, like Fox News. <laughs> but it's in people are it's like, no, no, it's I just don't believe not gonna believe it, not gonna believe it. But but this is what happens when something that changes the world. It makes some people live it, and some people so the smart ones get very quiet and get very busy. So this is very exciting. There's no doubt he did something. And it spread so quickly to what they call a uh, innovation valley, you know, the Connecticut Valley, where so many things were picked up, that they'll probably tell you on their websites that we started interchangeable parts, but you know, no, they didn't, but but it spread so fast. And you see, they're they're Yankees, they, they start, they're really good at taking advantage of these things. Okay, Hall's ideas became universal, disseminated through the minds of Hall's former machinists and armors who left for jobs at other armories nationwide. Hall's agreement with the Ordnance Department, and this is really, this is smart management. The government stipulated that all of Hall's ideas, even though he had the patent, be shared to the public. And, and so it's just like, it's like open source to all the world, and it worked, worked on and was worked on by anyone with Hall. And Hall got a royalty for arms for duty. Yeah, um, he got royalties for everything made at Harpers Ferry. Okay. There's another man who is not very often mentioned, but there was two geniuses. Let's say that Hall is facing one obstacle after another at Harpers Ferry, even after his success. But the ideas are flowing, flying free, and they're being worked on. They, they gave him such a hard time that he had a, all these states wanted militias for, I mean, guns for their militias. Oh, I, almost all the Congress, all the senators, like 50 of them. And they found a wording in, in the federal law that said you, you couldn't make them for militias. You had to go through a, like a contract. You couldn't do it. A federally paid ordinance consultant could not make, he couldn't do it directly. So he lost so much money. He's getting screwed, basically. But with some argument. I mean, there was a reason. The next thing, they cut his budget. This is the man who saved, you know, created the whole new world. Then, then under political pressure, they cut his budget. Do you know why? To make up for the huge deficit of the other side of Stubblefield, who didn't know how to manage. So they basically got, got back by taking it out of Paul. And the you know, it's, I'm saying all that out, it goes right to your point. Paul had no room 
to do a run, he had to move a machine over here. It's really heavy. You know, get them realigned up. They had to move machines around for every run because there's no more room. I mean, they were doing, how do you do this? How do you punish the, the one? Okay. But now you understand it was off and running. Back to context. We're talking about how quickly it spread. He had one genius uh, uh, protagonist. He was almost as Eric Johnson, my blacksmith friend. He said, I don't know how to put this. But James Henry Burton was the rock star of, of gunsmiths. And, okay, here we go. The beginning of the new American system of manufacture was also sadly, be, sadly the beginning of Hall's personal and cruel, yes, ungrateful marginalization in Harper's Ferry. As his opponents, whether because of jealousy or ignorance, reduced how many arms he could make and how much he would be paid. Truth was that one third of Hall's outlays for all those years was that he would call, that we would call experimental. His work on new machines gave, well, one third of his budget was all for the experimental work on machines and gauges. So his fast success meant his work was done. But his reward was laudatory rather than pleasantly pecuniary. So James Henry Burton, when they were squeezing Paul, a young man born in Shannondale Springs, you know, on the mountain, he, he goes up to um, Springfield, he comes back and you know he's working everywhere, and this is this is what's so interesting. He he's showing everybody how to do it, and then as things continued, Paul had to wear bear five more years of being sidelined, showered with the highest kudos, but not the riches he expected and disappointed, worn out, and burned out. He resigned, moved to Missouri, and died of what appears to have been tuberculosis. And we gotta listen to the wife. We gotta listen to the wife. On October 7th, 1841, his widow, we're not, there's more to the story after that. His widow, Statira Hall, wrote to Colonel Talcott at the Ordnance Department in Washington of what her husband, heroic sacrifice and patriotism meant. No one can know as I do the great sacrifices of both comfort and interest he has made. No one but myself can imagine his days of toil and nights of anxiety while inventing and perfecting his machinery. He never did for one minute hesitate to sacrifice his own interests when he thought it would interfere with the interests of his government. Had he, in 1820, listened to the proposals of foreign governments, he might now be enjoying health and prosperity, yet he refused. All because he thought by doing so, he should benefit his own country. He did not live to see what happened next. And this is when James Henry Burden is the one who really disseminates Hall. Remember we talked about the Crystal Palace, or did we talk about the Crystal Palace Exposition? Okay, this is great. This is, this, is the, this is the moment where suddenly everyone realized that Americans weren't bumpkins, but the new world's engineers. It's a wonderful story. Prince Albert was, un, was unbearably disciplined. He studied nine hours a day. He, he, he beat his son, Bertie, for not doing the same, which is why Bertie became what Bertie became. But here's the thing. Oh, it's on here. Do you all see the look at the Crystal Palace on there? That incredible building. Here, let me see, Dave. Here we go. That's Prince Albert's contribution. Unbelievable thing. This is world changing. It's the first world's fair. This is so dramatic. It's they. Almost every country in the world came. I've seen il colored illustrations of their exhibits. And they gave the Americans a huge space. And for a while, there was nothing in it, except for some 
apple peeler equipment. <laughs> there was just ridiculously nothing. And then this is the American way, you know, people just jump in. Boy, I love this. Like, oh my God, you know, it's going to be, what are you thinking? Horace Greeley gets busy of the Tribune and he writes long editorial. What are we doing? And then he finds a colleague, George Peabody, who at the time was like the first real American philanthropist. This is good. I'm glad, glad you're back. This is good now. We're at the Crystal Exposition in England. Americans are still country boys. But then, then I just said that Horace Greeley was complaining that the big exhibit, we have only apple peelers and junk here. It's like, like poopy dolls and stuff. And, 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 and really has a snit fit. And he, he says, look, all the money you want, I got it. Go get what we need. This is, man, if you're an American, this is the moment. You wish you were there. Well, Queen Victoria seems such a queen, you know. She, she's, she's never been, she's never seen, well, she thought it was going to be all very nice and lovely. But people came, millions of people flooded the place. And, like the queen is like totally mind blown by this. But everyone is so proud. Now, now the Americans have put up their exhibit. Cormac's Reaper? Cormac's Reaper? I say. The revolver? Never been a revolver before? Colt's revolver? I say. And then they had a locksmith. We had a guy named Hobbs. England is very proud of their banks and their security. And they had these locks that they swore no one could ever, ever crack. Well, Hobbs said, could you give me a minute? Talk about it. And once again, the American built skill of promoting. And he gets his, he gets his key. 10 minutes, cracks the lock of the biggest bag in England. <laughs> and everybody, it's so American, right? And, and then next thing you know, it's, oh, you fake, it's a fake. Do it again. Okay. <laughs> Five minutes. So the English are getting mind blown. That's then there's Matt, Matt, uh, Matthew Brady's photographs. And uh, Goodyear's vulcanized tires. This is all dropped on the world at once. And you know what won the prize? The company was called Robinson Lawrence. Interchangeable price. And that won the prize of all the others. Not only that, the Brits were so, I guess the only word is mind blown. The big money came over here. I think the word is gobsmacked. Gobsmacked, thank you. <laughs> The method of gun make, making went unveiled at the precedent-setting exposition at London's Crystal Palace, left the Brits stunned by these broad advances and scrambling for answers. I love that you look so upset a Brit. They dispatched a delegation. They didn't go looking for reapers or anything. You see, they're fighting the Crimean War. It's a problem. They dispatched a delegation to look at these publicly available inventions, look for potential hirelings, and they returned with a trove of arms, arms making equipment valued at $100,000 period money. And by, by the late, yeah, okay. James Henry Burton, the protege, almost as smart as Hall, was born in 1823, like I said, in Shenandoah Springs. And, and he's there, he's available for hire. He's the one who wrote, this is why it's hard to explain Hall because he put it very, of course, you read what Pope Burton says. Hall's system housed not an occasional machine, but a plant of milling machines by which the system and the economy of manufacture is materially altered. That's what survives. And so, so the Brits. I love the fact, do you think any Brit is ever going to let the world know the Royal Enfield factory was set up and managed by an American from Shenandoah Springs? That's like a state secret. You'll never find it on the website. And then he went on to set up three other arms works in the South. He was a Confederate. We're after the war. We're just about done. 
The war is over, nobody wants any more guns. I like to say the government contracts dried up almost as quickly as a desert flower after a spring rain. But the adaptation never stopped. You see the way Burton put that, it's a system, readapted. And Robinson Lawrence began, Robinson, yeah, began making Sharps rifles before the war, then they shifted. In 1873, the Weed Sewing Machine Company bought out Sharps. They converted the gun making equipment to make sewing machines. And then another man took the Weed Sewing Company and he developed those British high wheeler bikes. And that business boomed and then it diversified into all kinds of bicycles, you know. And, and then it became the Duryea automobile. All of those things had the hall work. And then basically Ford just put a, a, a moving belt under the assembly process of the same concept. So <clears throat> we're finishing. And it, I'm gonna, John, do me, do, do me this favor. Beforehand, John and I were talking, there is a much sharper divide between the culture of the farmer or artisan making beautiful weapons or things in a, in a leisurely kind of, you know, in a not necessarily speeded up manner to uh, a, a, a time clock driven, contract driven job. And what John pointed out to me, it went from the artisan to the precision, precision age. And John was telling me, you know, we said that John Hall could get a, had a gauge that was, it was considered incredible that it was down to one hundredth of an inch tolerance that you, it was acceptable. John, could you tell us what you told me about what color? They, they, they just took computers and plastic have taken this, these tolerances to another. Could you share that with us? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, when you manufacture a chip, right? <clears throat> so we've been moving from seven nanometer, so that's seven billionths of an inch. Most of our ships are constructed in that way. Today, we're moving to five. That's, that's, that, that's being completed as we speak. But IBM released last year, about this time, they released their uh, licensing for manufacture of two nanometers, two billions of an inch for a circuit uh, now embedded in the chip. So um, just for reference point, yeah, so we're talking about this, the spike protein on the COVID uh, virus is 20 nanometers. So we're making circuits today in a chip that are smaller in width-wise, nanometer-wise, than the COVID, just the spike protein on that on that person, on, on that on that chip for a reference point. And so you might say, well, so what? Well, now instead of three trillion calculations per second, we're now talking about moving from seven to two. We're going to be moving from six to seven trillion calculations a second in the same size chip at less than uh, probably 40 percent the energy that it took a seven nanometer. So, but the precision is is if you could just think about it, just like you said, it's all all a matter of how how far we take a precision um, down. Now, that's just the example. Yeah, you see that that really shapes it well. <laughs> From the artisan age to the precision age, but and, and some I don't know you don't you guys don't know Wendell Pease uh, maybe you know Wendell Pease so today who used to come to this you whatever Wendell is such a good uh, XML computer guy that he's a key consultant to the ANS science and to this the National Institute of Standards and Technology they depend on him so he's really smart. He was really interested in John Hall being a good humanities major, right? He had both sides, and, and he made me understand something. He said, Jim, the architecture, he had an 800 on his SATs, you know. He, he says, computers, design has an architecture. And in software, you, there's always been one thing known as the verification layer. And he says, it's the gauges. It's the... It's the grandchild of the gauges. And it's that one thing that says, no, no, it's not good enough. No, no, do it, you know. And so it was built in probably, I'll bet from the very beginning, 
I bet computers were not useful unless you got that, probably the calculator, you know. So, last paragraph. Hmm. John Hall was buried in the Hall Family Cemetery, Northeast Darksville, Missouri, in Randolph County. <clears throat> Even more recently, friends and family visited the, yes, weed choked graveyard with the stones for John Statira Hall <clears throat> to pull the weeds away and restore the dignity of such a vision. That's it. Was he important? I think so. Yes. Let's go back to the speed of manufacturing. Yes, yes. Um, when you compare the uh, rifle that Hall, Hall made, the breech loading, were they comparing that to the breech loading tool that was handmade when they did the testing? I, I think the best answer I can give you is that Simeon Hall was doing state of the art. Uh, rifle machinery when that experiment was undertaken. He had his own equipment, and it was a reflection of the best, so you know, it was his best available just before Hall's steps. And the first time he tried to do it, do interchangeable with parts made in Harvard's Ferry, he used just the gauges, and it didn't work. So I'm saying there's a difference. Hall said you did not use the patterns, you did not do exactly what I'm saying, and you did not make the machines. So that's, all I can say is, he was the best around before Hall, and it didn't work. And so, if there is the issue of speed, or did it work or not, everybody is concerned about, did it work? Then you worry about scalability. The problem in Harpers Ferry is you could never produce more than 9,000 weapons a year when they wanted 12. And I couldn't answer that because there were so many other compounding issues like his reduced budget his employees that he couldn't really get a good measurement, but he never could get real and Springfield could, you know, that they're basically the best answer I could give. I mean, and by the way, this, this is to make John Henry, James Henry Burton is the, he, he knew exactly, he's, he's quite a dude. I just wish he didn't go to the South. He built the Macon, the Macon gun works, the, the Fayetteville gun works, the Richmond gun works, the Enfields in England. He basically produced about a million rifles using Hall's method. So Al, I think that's the best answer. He showed how it could work, but it wasn't. Merritt Rose Smith always said Parker's Ferry was the proving ground. So uh, Hall would be the machine guy and the precision guy, the next great American. You know, in, in, in the industrial revolution, was a fellow by the name of Frederick Winslow Taylor. Thank you. And Taylor became the father of what is known as the uh, time and motion. And later, in, 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 uh, as we get up into the, the late uh, 19th century, you know, he was considered the father of literally scientific management. But another American, is this like the Deming method? Well, time and motion is yeah. would late would then complete the ground He's work for how you arrange the factory plan. How you, it was so important and that you, of course, you minimize the, the, the time and the motion, not just of the machines, but of course, the people that populated that assembly line. And uh, so that's very interesting. I had not really known that much about Hall. Hall was absolutely, and you see as an American contribution to the manufacturing process would be absolutely key. Uh, assemble. You could wish assemble. You pointed out how his thing was the workflow. Yeah. So you, you could get every, one machine pumping, but it's how you make them go for That's why it was so mind blowing and complicated. And so when, he, when they put this budget, he has to move his around, forget it. But and, the, and then take so the workflow and the right? Yeah, I, very much so. And, and, and a lot of it, I didn't know it. <laughs> for, for Taylor, another great American. You know, contributor to these kind of things, which you have the other, the other side of it, which is the repetitiveness on the factory floor and an assembly line. You know, before robots came on, which would be the next thing <laughs> that we all wind up replacing ourselves with, so we don't get bored of those. Not you and I was so, reading this spring. There's two good articles in Harper's. One was by a guy named John Abbott, which really describes these genes at Springfield. 
1952, you would not want to be an employee. If you if you do a die cast and they have a number to your gun, you're 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 docked the cost of the rifle. You know it, the whole thing. It, it wiped, you know it was it was severe. These machines were, like I said, were pounding out 33 die casts. Three to an 18 tilt machines, tilt hammers, not die casts at the time. Anybody ever been to Middletown, Connecticut? No. I have. You have you not spent a lot of time. Oh man. So if you want to see a an area that reminds you of Harpers Ferry, there it is, Connecticut River Valley. And Middletown is this neat little place for us. Middletown College is there. Uh, as well, one of the really great small universities in New England. Uh, but just the area, just, I mean, it just feels, feels, it's not, it feels the same. Yeah, as I, I, I know, I know the area. Yeah. How, about, how about you, Sandy, or you, you, young Dave? Yeah, the uh, Hall's, Hall's Gun Works, uh, were they located on uh, Virginus Island on the Shenandoah? Is that correct? Uh -huh. Interesting. Now, an interesting thing too, somehow in between all of these jobs, uh, Burton went to Enfield in England, but then he came back, and I just found this out. He he came back the, the armor again at Harper's Ferry, hmm. but it, became, it it sort of lost all its. It was not as important anymore. But it's 1850s. Think about this, President Buchanan. With the war approaching, and the Secretary of War was Jefferson Davis, and the head of the Harvest Ferry Army was a hardcore Confederate. So, are these the secret, the secret desires of President Buchanan? Um, what I'm getting at with Burton, when the Harvest Ferry, uh, I'm, I'm confused. I'm not sure if someone's right about this. Either he pulled them out when the rifles, rifle works was destroyed, and in uh, 1862, when they burned the Hur's Mill, the point is he got that machinery out and sent it to, fit to Richmond. He knew knew all about the machinery, and he made sure it got to, to Richmond. Whether it was in 1862, at the, before they towards the rifle works, or somehow it was the arsenal. They often say it's the arsenal, but maybe they But he got the machinery. And are you ready to make a musket? <laughs> That Burton was was trained. You said that um, Hall was a mentor. Did he actually train Burton, or did Burton pick up on this as a result of what Hall had already invented and made? He, he uh, Burton was born in eighteen, I think twenty three, but he not right, he came toward the very end. But Hall was still there and still alive, and all of his equipment was still up and running at peak. You know that's where the situation was, and and he was he was a genius too. He had a five. He had, he went to a very important private school as a kid, and then he went to Baltimore and apprenticed for five years as a machine toolist, to, you know, machinist. So he could pick it up, could pick all of it up. That's but he was very fortunate. There was a little overlap. I were for him. Um, the old patents that. Um, all the uh, um, where are they now? We lost a lot. We lost a lot of them in the fire. Yes, I mean, I mean, I was Mary Rose Smith says the big one, you know, right after the Carrington report, and he just before he signs his contract, he, he patents. He said, that in his own words, has disappeared from the files, and you know. It probably, you know, well, I think by all the world we want it. Well, they didn't have fax machines, so you steal it. <laughs> How many people would have wanted that fax? You know? We think the Chinese took it. That, of course. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. But isn't it interesting? Everything has to start somewhere. So we got about 15 minutes left. I just wonder if we can talk about the, this or just have you gotten something out of the course? And uh, you know what? Did you are there certain program one classes that were more interesting to you or more more deficient than others? 
-hmm. And you know, I, I'm not gonna, we're just gonna do it for the, we're gonna do it until you wanna, wanna quit. <laughs> Do you have a much better sense of where you live from all of this? And, um, all have any uh, yes, formal it. education? Never seen it. There's not a single biography of Paul. You're not going to find hardly anything of significance on ancestry about John. I went to the, you know, I'm always looking for places to look. I tried the main archives, the main historical society. Nothing of important. It's weird. How did he wind up in Missouri? A job? Well, Civil War. I mean, people people were moving out there because of the pressures of the Civil War. I, I don't know why they went. A lot of people here went to Missouri. Yeah. But, uh, you know, time is hard to appreciate pressures they were under, but it was, it really was hard how pig-headed and hard-headed. It's 1854, you see, Thomas died. He doesn't have any clout anymore. Our congressman is John Faulkner. I mean, he's a big deal. He's one of those, he was ambassador to France, Charles Faulkner. And a very, probably the most important person out of the pen. He lobbied to basically uh, kind of curtail a lot of the operations there. And then I think Burton came back and, and started running again, but they did, they did everything to stop it. Yes. So you asked about the courts. Yeah. Um, uh, one thing that would be helpful to me is to see uh, a map and maybe photos of houses when we're talking about different people, because some of them still exist, but even just knowing where they were, um, I'm fascinated by that. It's the, you know, it's kind of an overlap between. No, no. Are some of you interested in what Sheila said about the houses? I have a whole thing like this with all the Washington homes Yeah. on a big map right. and their names and, yeah, okay. That's the one thing we haven't done is, is, is homes and, and architectural history. Yeah. Just read up of my Johnny just Allen. location, you know, just so because that to me, it, it gives roots to these, the names and the stories and everything. And then Thank you. Thank you. where they are, where they yeah, were. Yeah, because so Julia, Julia Davis is right there, Media Farm near Daniel's yeah. Road. You know where that is. So I was excited. When I, when, you know, you put that out, I'm like, I know where that is. And so, you know, when you know these stories and you drive around the county, yeah. it's like, yep, yep, <laughs> yep. You know, I mean, when you walk down Daniels Road, that's where Stonewall Jackson's been. We're coming from Harper's Ferry. They came, the wine, they, they took the road to Weinbrenner's Crossroads, and then they came down Warm Springs, you know, they're like uh, Harneysville. Mm -hmm. And they, then they cut over to Daniels Road. And they cut right across that big field where the houses are. That, that was, that's Jackson's 8,000 men. But not, it's, now I know that. It's interesting. And they put artillery up at Best Road and Bankerton Road. Okay, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, early on about Chaplin's choice. Choice. See, Dave knows this. You live at Chaplin's choice, right? Take a, it's the, if the first, if the first traffic light coming out of Shepherdstown on 45 is McDonald's, the second traffic light, uh, you would take a left to go on the, to the bypass to go to 480, instead take a right. And <laughs> as you begin to uh, bend to the left, you immediately would take the first right and descend a few feet into uh, Chapline's Choice. It's about 60 homes, and it's a, in effect a big cul-de-sac. So no one goes back there unless they live there because there's no way out. All right. Yes. Are you familiar with this book, The Prominent Men of Shepherdstown, 1762 to 1962? Dean Kenneman was the author. Very good. And, uh, and you know, I, I agree with you, Sandy, because he was the professor at Shepherd. We had some professors like him and, um, um, come on, a woman who wrote James Rumsey. 
Well, they, they went to Columbia, good colleges, and he was president of the historical society. So, so when you read it, you know this, Sandy, it is dense and stone accurate. It's not a word, you know, Sandy gets online. You find the Rumsey, the only book, Ella May Turner. Ella May Turner is the other great scholar. It's so important. It's on Hottie Trust, the best book on James Rumsey. It finally got online. And so is the 100, what is it, 100 men, Prominent Men of Shepherdstown? Is that the title? By prominent Men. Prominent Men of, by A.D. Kenneman. And, and they, they have a way of sneaking online. Thank you, Sandy. Kirchhoff, for the early period, Samuel Kirchhoff, K-E-R-C-H-E-V-A-L, the history of the Shenandoah Valley, 1831. He knew everyone personally, and he very carefully tells you who told him, you know. He lived in Winchester. So those, those are the great books. Bill, do you got any thoughts, questions? Uh, you mentioned earlier today in the, uh, about the wheel, wheel balancing. Yeah. When did that be, become invented or patented? Or is it something that... I, I, don't, I, don't I, know, but you know what? I always think of it the old days when your tires didn't work right. You know, they were bounced all yeah, over yeah. the road. Yeah. You know, well, frankly... You never thought of as being that far back in well, time. Well, to be very specific, the Carrington guys actually recommended that. That was one of their suggestions. They're very good people. You know, he got it from them and he, he built it in. So by 1820, by 1827, this would be classic John Hall. You're always changing it, but you're trying to have interchangeability. No wonder he drove them crazy. Oh no, this can be better. <laughs> what if they're interchangeable now? No, it can be better. Drove them crazy, I'm sure. But then by 1827, with all change, it was fixed and ready to rock. But it came out of the Carrington report. You know, I have to say this thing uh, about Hall and the fact that he used his brilliance to uh, create um, rifles and, and uh, guns and things like that. It reminds me of another one of America's original sins. You know, I always thought of it was they always say slavery was the original sin because it helped to build the country. But here I'm seeing this is where we were first arms merchants. And we, you know, we went over to London and the thing we brought to the party was guns. Well, you know, yeah, the, Brit <laughs> the British were fairly shameless about dominating things, you know. How do you get big castles, you know? But uh, yeah, that's that. And, and all of you know what DARPA is, right? If you understood DARPA, the world, this is the strange thing. So many things, Silicon Valley was fed by DARPA. And the reason is, the reason is, is back in the 60s, the generals and colonels were very cool. Look, they're crazy, I don't know what they're doing, just go do it. They let them, that's, that was, that was well, just go do it. And that's what you do with brilliant people. And that, and, you know, did you know the Larry Ellison Oracle? That was all out of come, come the secret work, the DARPA, the internet, you know, everything. My father was the, uh, project manager at Fort Belvoir of the Night Vision Laboratories. You know, but, but DARPA, it's a strange thing. It, they said, let's have an internet in case there's a worldwide Holocaust, right? That's what it was for. So, but it just kind of, it chills you out that the money is always where right. the arms are. Well, and I wasn't criticizing Hall no, no. for his choice. I was just noting, mm -hmm. now this goes back a long ways. It, you know, and he's where he could get paid. Yes, That's it. Yeah, right. he's too. Right, so. right. And he chose a very complicated thing. I mean, this was like a great project. So. And he had to work so hard with people. Like, man, here, they didn't, they didn't they, I don't care if it's the best thing in the world. It's not, you know. That's that old pig-headed. It's always there. Somebody's fighting you. But he, he made it. That's the thing. That's what's so exciting about Carrington. Like, <laughs> what is it? The machines we have examined work with certainty and precision we should have not believed till we witness our operation. Well, look, I've had a great time with you all. And um, I hope you had a little bit of a great time. There's some facts for you. Thank you. See, that, that was my cue line. But I did have fun. And 1029, let's go.
Hope you, hope you, hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Thanks, Jim. Thank Wonderful. Bye. Oh, good, good, good. You want these back? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>